Father, we glorify your holy name on this memorial day and we remember, we remember those who have fought the battle and Lord, those who have passed away, those who are living to be able to give their testimonies. I thank you for this, Lord, in the name of Jesus. I had an uncle, he was my parent, and he was in the army, <clears throat> and um, he was a toughie. I mean, a toughie, toughie, toughie. Tough and a man. I mean, I'm talking about he was a man, okay? <laughs> You're a man. And uh, I got to minister the gospel to him before he died. He lived in Abbeville when he came back, and uh, that's where he was from, and my he was my uh, my parent. And, oh, he was a blessing. He There was a funeral that he had to go to in... Uh, over here, and he was on the East Coast, and so he there was an airplane flying, and he made arrangements with the military and everything that he parachuted out in Abbeville, over over Abbeville. <laughs> he was a tough guy, <laughs> and he told us some of the experiences that he had had, and he's glad to be alive. <laughs> near misses, no hits, but near misses, you know. <laughs> What's that? A parent, a godfather. It's in a Catholic church. It's it's. it's like a godfather and the godmother, the godfather. Like yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but I got to preach the gospel to him before he died, he and his little wife. And uh, so we just believe in great, great things. Say amen. amen. Now let's begin. Uh, you know that I went through uh, Jeremiah chapter 30, correct? Remember that? And I went through every verse. And uh, it's like I exegeted each verse. You understand? This is what I did. And uh, then I'm going to go through uh, Jeremiah chapter 31 next. Not today. Uh, but I'm going to go through Jeremiah chapter 31 also that way. And um, the, uh, in Jeremiah chapter 30, we learned about the time of Jacob's trouble. That's uh, the great tribulation period. And... Uh, I was talking to a gentleman the other day, and he was telling me that he works for an insurance company, and he still does, and he was called recently to Arkansas to do an estimation of the damage, and there were hailstones that were the size of um, of melons, you know those, uh, what do you call those things? Cantaloupe, cantaloupe melons, hailstones the size of cantaloupes, and it uh, destroyed in in that uh, towns in, in towns there, uh, the roofs, uh, the skylights, uh, automobiles, uh, boats, uh, just uh, anything you can imagine. Can you imagine cantaloupe-sized hailstones? I've never heard of that before, but there they were. Yeah, that's about that big. That's right. And uh, we don't know what's going to be going on during the seven years of hell on earth when we have the seven-year period of tribulation. There's going to be hundred. Uh, pound hailstones are going to plummet the earth. Uh, scorpions that sting so severely that the people who are afflicted thereby will wish to commit suicide but will be unable to do that. The Antichrist will seek to destroy the Jews and those that do finally get saved during that time, that tribulation, and anyone that refuses the mark of the beast, their very life will be in jeopardy. But Israel will come through that period of time, the seven-year period of tribulation, and all things will be <coughs> right again, okay? Zechariah tells us that when they see Jesus returning the second time at the end of the seven-year period, that this is after we have already been raptured up, of course. We've been raptured up before the seven-year period of tribulation uh, starts up um, at the end of the period of tribulation. And when they see Jesus coming back, the second time, and having realized their error, they will say to Jesus, where did we, you know, where did you get those wounds? And Jesus will respond, I got those wounds in the house of my friends. Romans chapter 11, verse 22 through 27. Revelation chapter 11, verse 22 to, two to 27. Behold, Revelation chapter 11, verse 22 Therefore, the, God, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity, but towards thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. 
Romans 11, 23. I said, I made Romans. Did I say Revelation? You said Romans and you went to Revelation. Well, it's in Romans. Yeah. Sorry about that. Revelation eleven twenty three, And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Hmm. Let me read verse 26 of Romans 11 again. I mean, not again, but now. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn again ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Now, it's not a strange thing that Annette said the restitution. She mentioned the word restitution, and it caught in my heart because I was going to talk a little bit about it. Restoration uh, speaks of the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is going to come to its senses, seeing their light for the promise and covenant of the Old Testament towards the Jewish people. It's unconditional. The privileges they're going to have and all is unconditional. You know that they are gone. There's going to be a great revival of the Jewish people. Now, they don't believe in Jesus Christ as being the Savior and all that now. They, they don't believe that. Oh, no, 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 no. You talk about going to change. The promises made towards Israel are going to happen that the nation of Israel should be restored and the king will reign from Jerusalem. I think that this is going to be a sudden awa awakening to the to uh, Judaism and the Israelis. Judaism. You know what Judaism is? It's the monotheistic religion of the Jews based on the laws revealed to Moses and recorded in the Torah. That's uh, supplemented by the rabbinical Talmud. Monotheistic. The doctrine or belief that there is only one God who are normally, the majority of them, are completely agnostic and atheistic. The majority of the Jews, agnostic and atheistic. Torah is the law of God. But what do they believe? Watch. As revealed to Moses and recorded in the first five books of the Hebrew Scripture, the Pentateuch, the Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, Leviticus. Pentateuch, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Agnostic, a lot of them are agnostic, the Jews. A person who believes that nothing is known or can be known of the existence or nature of God or anything beyond material phenomena, that which you can see. A person who claims neither faith but doesn't claim disbelief in God either. He just, no faith, but, you know, I have my doubts about this, you know. Atheistic, the theory of belief that God does not exist. None of them must have been physics majors. And none of them, none of them must have been astrophysicist majors in order for them to believe there's no God. I get, there's not probably, I'd like to say a day, but I'm going to say a week or a few days anyway that I see something that doesn't amaze me at God's creation. I'm sitting in the dentist last week. One of my little crowns popped out. I have to go back Tuesday. It popped out again. It's a temporary until my permanent comes in. And I'm looking at that chart of the wall, and I'm looking at that thing. I'm just looking at the gums and the teeth and the root, the roots of the teeth,
and when the teeth come into maturity at different levels and everything else and all of this, I'm amazed at the mouth that God made. And you can imagine what the universe is like. I mean, and what the speed of light is. You know, if you can go, how fast is light? Light travels. If it were to go around the earth, it would go eight, about eight and a half times a second. Can you imagine that? At the speed of 2.99792 10 to blah, times 10 to the 20. That, listen to this. It goes around the earth about eight and a half times in one second, if it were to go around, but it doesn't. And it goes in a straight line. It's bent by gravitational fields, of course, but it just, whoo, and the universe is constantly expanding. Expanding into what? Well, you, between here and the moon or here and the sun, there's space, right? So light travels in that space. Well, there is an edge of the universe where there's no space. So the light is still moving that fast into nothingness. Nobody can understand that. My students could never understand that. You know what I'm talking about? You know what? <laughs> they could never. Well, of course you can't understand. Don't, don't, don't try to. And your eyes have to be somewhat open that there's a God just by looking up and buying or going to the library and open up books on on astrophysics, or astronomy, or whatever, to think we have 560 billion estimated other galaxies besides our own in our in our here, you know. I mean, uh, 560 uh, in our Milky Way, 560 billion stars in our own galaxy, and there are 560 billion other galaxies we estimate. I mean, and what for? You don't need but the planet Earth and a star to have life. Don't need anything else. Any, anything else could be a hindrance. And they don't realize the protection that God has given us on this planet to have life. Because with all that that goes on and all the meteorites and all the effect of the, uh, of the big belt of rocks that travel around near Jupiter, every time they go near Jupiter, they get twerped a little bit. They're protected from coming to the earth because God's hand is there. It's not just a matter of, if God's hand wasn't on it, then I can tell you the twerping of all these in the asteroid belt, in all of those asteroids, we'd have been destroyed a long time ago. They don't understand that. They do not understand how the Gulf of Mexico was, was formed. To think how the Gulf of Mexico was formed with some gigantic asteroid that created that hole and everything else and then filled up with water. They, they do not understand. Yeah, we have proof of that. Now, all of the things, and God protected us, formed America, made Florida, and the opening around Mexico and all of that. They just don't understand, but the atheists, the theory or belief that God does not exist. Let, let me repeat about the re restitution of all things speaks of the nation of Israel. Guess what? Israel is going to suddenly change their minds. Israel. Oh, no. They, you know, you know. Oh, yeah. They're going to come to their senses. They're going to come to the light for the promises and covenant of the Old Testament towards the Jewish people are unconditional. The promises made toward Israel are going to happen in prophecy. That the nation of Israel shall be restored and the king of kings will reign in Jerusalem. He's going to reign in Jerusalem. Listen, the restitution of all things is not dealing with the eternal condition of the soul. Your soul is saved and you're going to live forever. There's, do you know what eternal means? That means what? Forever, but that also applies, applies to those going to hell. You know what eternal means there? Forever. There's eternal life and there's eternal death. Well, like I said earlier in the teaching I did a couple of weeks ago, if there is such a thing as eternal life and you believe that, that means you what? You believe you're going to live forever, right? In heaven, right? True or false? Well, then... You're going to have a different meaning for eternal hell 
and say eternal hell isn't forever when you burn off the, the weight for your sins and everything else, that, you know, no. well, if there is eternal life, the word eternal, if you look up the definition of it, means forever. Well, then you're going to have a different definition for eternal hell? You're going to make it only the amount of time you lived on earth and you sin? No. There's no different definition for the word eternal. In the Hebrew and in the Greek, there's no difference of a definition for eternal. Eternal has one definition. It means forever. Okay? In restitution, Israel will acknowledge Jesus as Lord. Israel is finally going to see the light. However, it's going to be a difficult day. Israel is going to have to go through in order to see that light. It's not going to be easy. But they will see the light. In Jeremiah chapter 30, is really called Jeremiah chapter 30. I read every scripture, right? I read every verse in Jeremiah chapter 30. Now, guess what I just got through doing, okay, Thursday. I got through exegeting again, going through every scripture in Jeremiah 31. So you're going to have that next that handout I'm going to give you in the King James, and then I'm going to explain each verse, each verse again like I did in Jeremiah chapter 30. We have all of that. Now, Jeremiah chapter 30 is, as you know, known as the time of, of Jacob's trouble. Now, why are you doing Jeremiah chapter 30 and Jeremiah chapter 31 so uniquely and intrinsically involved in the detailish things? Because I'm going to show you that the Jews are going to get saved. Israel is coming back. This is really the great, the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah chapter 30, as you understood, that that's the great tribulation period, right? The great tribulation period. Which is going to come upon us? Now, we may not be here, but it's going to come, okay? The Great Tribulation period, Jeremiah chapter 30. I'm going to just read verse 1 to 6. Do you mind if I just, well, no, no, no. Well, okay, I'll, I'll read it. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 1 to 6. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the day is come, saith the Lord, that I will... Bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord. I will bring again the captivity. I will bring again the captivity, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. How about that, huh? Hmm. And these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man does travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. That is, I'm about to have a baby. You know, it's like, it's fixing to be a change in my life. You know, when you have a baby, there's a change in your life. And, and, and if you have a baby, and you're married, there's going to be a change in his life too, Okay. I mean, a drastic change. Well, there's going to be a change in the life of the Israelites. And there's going to be a period of what we call hell on earth. A seven-year period of tribulation. Hundred-pound hailstones. Scorpions that sting, like I said a while ago. So severely that people who are affected thereby will wish to commit suicide, but will be unable to do that. The Antichrist will seek to destroy the Jews and those that do finally get saved during that time, that tribulation, and anyone that refuses the mark of the beast, their very life will be in jeopardy. But Israel, Israel, Israel will come through that period of time, the seven-year period, and will be set right. Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 declare that all Israel will be saved. Romans Chapters 9, 10, and 11. Now, I could exegete that for you. If I, if the Lord tells me to, I will. Okay? I'll give you the King James if I have, but he hadn't told me yet. Now, Romans chapter 9, 10, 11 declares that all Israel will be saved at that time during the seven-year period of tribulation. 
the restitution of all things speaks. Now wait, when we talk about the restitution of all things, well, what, what does that mean? What, what, what's going on? That's the restitution of Israel. That's what's talked about. It's Israel coming to her senses. That means that they will see the light. The Israelites will see the light. God's hand is on Israel. God gives him a choice. Yes or no. But Israel will see the light. God knows how to save to the what? For the promises and covenants of the Old Testament towards all the Jewish people are unconditional. The promises and the, all that and everything else, the Old Testament, the promises, the covenants toward Israel are unconditional. That means that the promises and covenants are most certainly, absolutely going to happen. The promises toward Israel in the Bible will happen. No doubt, 100%. The nation of Israel shall be restored, shall be restored. And the king, who's the king? Jesus Christ, shall rule and reign where? In Jerusalem. Listen, today in Israel, a remarkable thing is happening. I know you heard about this because you watch television. Karl Marx, known as the father of modern communism, Maybe you don't understand fully what's going on in, in Russia. Russia is in deep, 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 deep trouble. <coughs> Karl Marx, the father of modern communism, was in fact himself a Jew. Mm -hmm. And since the beginning of the founding of the modern state of Israel in 1948, Many, many of the Jewish young people and intellectuals have been fascinated. Listen to me well. Many of the Jewish people have been fascinated by the Karl Marx belief in modern communism. Many of the Jews have gone there. You got it? Going over there to Russia. Oh, yeah. They share everything. Everyone Lives exactly the same. There's no bureaucracy. There is no different levels of hierarchy. Hierarchy, that is where there is no rank of people or group of people ranked above another. Everything is plateaued. But since, now, I know you know this. I'm going to make a statement. This won't shock you. Since the collapse of communism, y'all do know that communism has collapsed. Since the collapse of communism in the Soviet Union, tens of hundreds of thousands of Jews are coming back, have come back. Since the collapse of communism in Russia, Russia is in deep trouble <sighs> of Jews who are turning away. These Jews are turning away from communism they're turning away from Russia. And the Marxism, they have been taught as little babies and grown up, they're turning away from Marxism. You think God is on the road to saving Israel and are coming back to Israel? And a return, guess what's coming back? A return of traditional Judaism. The prayers that start on Friday night and Saturday night, and all this, I have all that. Once again, there is a massive movement to explore. Once again, they're all interested, getting interested in traditional Judaism. I want to know what y'all y'all have so much. They want to come back. Many of them were born up in Russia. They come back now, and these kids, the, the parents are changing. The kids are being taught differently, and everything else. And uh, now today, they they're keeping the Sabbath day. The Israelis in Israel are keeping the Sabbath day. Can you imagine? Once again, it's, it's a day of religious observance, the Sabbath day, uh, and abstinence from work. They don't work. They're, uh, they're kept by Jews from sunset Friday evening till sunset Saturday evening. Oh, don't you work. Man, you don't pick up your wheelbarrow. Uh-uh, you don't plow the field. Uh-uh. 
Sabbath day, a day that's 52 weeks out of the year. In addition, they're keeping the hours of prayer. The Jews are again keeping the hours of prayer. The Shema, S-H-E-M-A. They're keeping the Shema of a prayer that serves as a centerpiece of the morning and evening prayer service. In addition, they're learning the Torah. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible, right? Okay. Torah, the law of God revealed by Moses. It's also known as the Pentateuch. That's remarkable. Listen, we're, we're, we're close. We're getting close. And we're not going to just continue to live our lives like, like this. If God did a work in the Israelites, nothing's impossible with God. If you're willing to release your life to him in its entirety, he'll have you following him in a way that's going to be set your traditional walk and talk with the Lord. That's remarkable. The Torah, the law of God is revealed to Moses, recorded in the first five books I told you, the Pentateuch. It's a scroll that is remarkable in its own way that there is the crumbling of the communism in Russia. And just like there was a dismantling, boy, this shocked me when I saw the Berlin Wall come down. When I saw that on television that afternoon, the tumbling of communism, the Berlin Wall, oh! Did we shout or did we? I shout it? Yeah, we shout it. Many people are saying that, and here's what a lot of people are saying. God's through with Israel. The atheist. God is through with Israel. That the nation that we see is just an interesting, coincidental, historically nation that it has no relevancy at all. No relevancy in prophecy. No relevancy on this planet has never had its relevancy. Never. And that all the prophecies that are given to Israel were fortified by Israel when they crucified Jesus Christ. And you know why we say that? Why they say that? Because they killed Jesus Christ. They killed him. He's dead. Make a big thing out of this. And now the church is now the inheritor of all the blessings. I'm talking about us, the church. We have an inheritance of all the blessings, all the promises. And that, but here's the thing. The world believes that there's no future plan for the nation of Israel. You know why? They haven't read Jeremiah chapter 30, which we exegetically went through, and Jeremiah 31. I'm going to start Jeremiah 31 soon, okay? Oh, no, man, there's no relevance to Israel. They haven't read the Bible, and that's the problem. They haven't read the Bible. They haven't read the Bible. They haven't read the Bible. Now, if you're interested in this, in this subject, I, I recommend a book to you by Hal Lindsey entitled The Road to the Holy Cause. It's called the Holocaust. <laughs> Holy Cause. <laughs> Holocaust. How does it pronounce? Holocaust? As a little interest, they're going to wonder what's going on. Now, Hal Lindsey entitled The Road to the Holocaust, Holocaust, published in 1990. It's published in 1990. There are, there are a couple of books that I was thinking, but I, I don't really need that. Uh, you know, uh, there were two left that I, uh, I was interested in. They're $225 a piece. There's only two copies left in, uh, in, the, in the 1940s. But I don't need that, I, I believe, you know. I know what's going on. I don't need the books. In which Hal Lindsey documents that throughout history, when the communists, when the Christian community had wiped Israel out of the uh, prophetic scheme, which they did, the Christian, oh, Israel, oh, no, that's, that's, that's not important. Inevitably and ultimately, 
it leads to the persecution against the Jews. A persecution against the Jews is called, you ever hear the term anti-Semitism? Well, that's, they're talking about the Jews, anti-Semitism. Oh, man, the Jews, oh, nothing's going to be going on there. And the um, Holocaust in uh, Germany, oh, no, man. If you begin to wipe Israel out and say that God is through with Israel, but he's not, you dig in to open up the teachings that Jews are Christ killers. That's what they believe. Yeah, they always come back to Jesus. They kill Jesus, Christ killers, and have no place in prophecy. They are wrong, wrong, wrong. Well, no, they killed Jesus. They crucified him. Boy, can you imagine to get off, you know? I'm going to repeat what Peter said in Acts chapter 3, verse 18 to 21. In Acts chapter 3, verse 18 to 21. But those things which God before had sh showed by the mouth of all the prophets, Acts chapter 3, verse 18, that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. Listen to this. God prophesied that he would suffer. And that's prophecy. It's prophecy. That Christ should suffer. That we be fulfilled. In Acts 3.19, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he, this is the, when it says he, that's the Father. When he, that's the Father, shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. You see? i got to read that 20th verse again, Acts 3.20. And he, that's the Father, shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. God determined ahead of time that he was going to kill him. You understand? Somebody had to do it. But why did he pick? Them to do it. Jesus, I mean, why did he pick the, the Israelis to do it? It's part of his plan. Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And, and then Peter begins to quote the uh, prophets in, in, in the next verse. Let me read. I'll, I'll, I'll read it. Acts chapter 3, verse 22. Let, let me read that and through, through 225. Acts chapter 3, verse 22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass, Acts 3.23, that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. The prophet that should be raised up is guess who? Jesus. Jesus is a prophet in Acts chapter 3 verse 22. Let me read that again. And it shall come to pass that every soul that will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. That prophet is Jesus. Look at the 24th and 25th verse, and then I'll read the 26th. Acts chapter 3, 24. And, yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. It was prophesied. Ye, in Acts 3, 25, are the children of those prophets and of the covenant which God made with your father, saying to Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindred of the earth be blessed. And in thy seed shall all the kindred of the earth be blessed. And as you remember, in Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, I'm going to verify this in Genesis 22, 18. And in thy sea shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That's because he obeyed the voice. 
it says, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Let me read verse Acts 3.26. I'm, I'm, I'm going to read that last verse. Acts 3.26. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Listen, I want, I want you to catch the flow here. Understand the context of this. Peter is speaking to those who have gathered there in the porch area of the temple. You murdered him, speaking of Jesus. You murdered him. This author of life, you did so in ignorance. His death, but listen to this. We know you murdered him, but his death was on purpose and was prophesied that he would die for your sins. Now, if you want to enter in into the times of refreshing, which is promised by the Old Testament prophets, you get in on your face and repent and get converted. You can get on your face and repent and get converted and mean to do business with God. I'm not playing church anymore. I'm not going to go to church Sunday. Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And in verse chapter, Acts chapter 3 verse 20. And he, this is the Father, and the Father shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you. Verse 21. I'm just repeating what I read a while ago. Whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution. Of all things. Hmm. That gospel is going to be preached around the world. Until the time of the restitution. Of all things. Now what is the. What, what is the restitution of all things. Here's what it means. Restitution of all things. That means. Until all things are prophetically prepared. And then he quotes Moses, Samuel, and Abraham in Acts chapter 3, verse 22. I found this very interesting. He quotes Moses, the writer of the Pentateuch, the hearer of the word described as to be called the Pentateuch, first five books. And he speaks to Samuel, and then he speaks of Abraham. Look at in Acts chapter 3, verse 22. And Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. Acts chapter 3 verse 22. Like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed among the people. Verse 24 of Acts chapter 3. Yea, and all the prophets from Israel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. It was prophesied. Ye, in Acts 3.25, are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. So he spoke of Moses, he spoke of Samuel, and he speaks of Abraham. Therefore he quotes those three concerning the promises that were made to Israel. They were made to Israel. Boy, you talk about going to be, those promises were the concerning the promises and concerns the blessings that would come to Israel. And also concerning the promised prophet Jesus Christ, it was prophesied he would come and die for our sins. And he did. It was promised, and that was fulfilled. You can see that Peter had a tremendous handle of the Word of God. This guy, Peter, amazes me. One, I mean, me so much. You know, we, we have the disciples of Jesus Christ, and they walk with Jesus, and they talk with Jesus. They heard his preachings and everything. And here's Peter. I mean, and 
Who gets quoted? I mean, Peter, if you read Peter, he says things that are unbelievably true. They're true, but where did he? And he takes scripture of the Old Testament and uses those Old Testament. How did he learn so much in this time? Wait, this amazes me compared to the other disciples of Jesus Christ. Watch. This guy was an ordinary fisherman. <laughs> and that's what he did. Fish. That's all he did. And he knows the Old Testament like he's memorized it. You know what I mean? I'm amazed at this guy, this fisherman. He outshines all of the rest in that way. To me, anyway, that's to me. But I want to tell you the truth. If you want to be used by the Lord, here is how it happens. Well, I'd like to be used of the Lord. Here's where it starts. What's going to happen in my life for it to happen? You want to be used of the Lord? You want to be quoted like Peter was quoted? Peter amazes me at the knowledge of the Old Testament. I mean, he's in a situation, and then all of a sudden he pulls out some scripture that just, like it was, that scripture was in the Old Testament, was prophesied for this moment. I mean, like, Peter, where'd you get that? Did you have that in your glove compartment on your, on your ship, on your boat? He didn't have a ship. He had a little boat probably. You know, he was a fisherman. You want to be used of the Lord? Write these four words down. Learn the Bible thoroughly. Learn. You want to be used of the Lord? Learn the Bible thoroughly. And I believe that God will use any man or woman who make the determination to learn the Bible. You'll be used. Any, any person that makes that commitment, is, God's going to use them. There are so many things happening, going on in America today where we live. Amazingly, things uh, that I'm seeing are happening in, happening in biblical prophecy. I say, well, yeah, I knew this was going to happen. Man, <laughs> I mean... Amazing things. And the Lord is looking for men and women. And I can I want to add children. I mean, they're going to grow up who can explain from the scriptures what is taking place in the world that we're living in right now. They're going to be able to tell you why this is going on. Well, well what's going on? Maybe they will tell you what's going to happen. I cannot stress this enough. You've got to learn the Bible. You've got to learn the Bible. You've got to learn the Bible. Well, you know what I heard? I said, you've got to learn the Bible. You can make it a hobby. It's a wonderful hobby. And it's going to be a great, great experience for you. It's pleasurable. It's stimulating. And it's unfathomable. You can't, golly, look how that fit over here. <laughs> you go 15 books later, you know, you, you look at that chapters later. Not only will you be filled in your heart, but your heart's going to, see, here's your heart, right? Not only will you be filled in your heart, it's not only you just went grocery shopping, but now you're going to get to eat it. When you go shopping for food, you shop to eat, right? Well, your mind, your will, and the emotions is right here, okay? That's the heart of man. Don't listen to any preacher that says this is the heart. That's dumb. But they don't know any better. They just don't know any better. You got to forgive them. They know not what they say. It, it's not dumb. Forgive me, Lord. They haven't reached the point yet, the truth yet. This can't make it. God does not look at the countenance of man. He looks at the heart. Well, why not look at the kidney? If you're going to look at the heart, look at the spleen. If you're going to look at the heart, look, look, look at the, the thumb. Look at the little finger. None of that can think. You know, not, the heart can't think. God does not look at the countenance of man. 
He looks at the heart. And I, I'm not going through that because you heard me say that so many times. Here's your heart, your mind, your will, and your emotions. That's what determines your destiny. That's what determines what you're going to do when you have that word inside here. When you have this word in here, listen to this. When you have the word in here, it's going to shock you what you know. Not to brag on. Forget that. When you're going to be surprised at what comes forth, how he puts things together, like he did Peter. Jesus is my model, not, not I mean, uh, Jesus is my model, not Peter, but I mean, I'm amazed at this fisherman, a fisherman. Man, I'm glad to be alive today. The closest I got to water, but look, when I was a freshman in, in, in college, I used to go swimming in the Vermilion Bayou at night, 10, 1030 at night, okay? <laughs> we'd leave the car lights on, the car. And we go in the bayou, we go to Intercoastal City and dive in the water, swimming. I used to go to Little Bayou, okay? Little Bayou before Intercoastal City over there. And we go, we go swimming in, in the uh, daytime. But I, I quit that because guess what else was in that little bayou? <laughs> Alligators, okay? And I might have missed one, you know? Might have missed one. Well, I'm glad I missed one. I'm glad he missed me. Okay, now, Peter knew the scripture. He learned the scriptures. He pointed to the person of Jesus Christ. So now, listen. Listen to the word. Take notes. Get you some CDs on the word. Write in your Bible. Don't be afraid to write in your Bible. I mean, write in your Bible. Man, I was doing some research last week. And man, I knew I had done something on this and where it was. And I got... My, 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 my old, you know, my Bible with the covers are gone. I got my Bible. And guess what? In Genesis, I find out exactly at the beginning, one of the days of creation, I find out probably 25 years or 30 years ago, I wrote some little notes down. And I remembered it. He called it to my remembrance to go there and look to see what I wrote. You understand what I mean? Back 20-something years. And I found it. Man, I made a copy of it, and I stuck it in my notes. Golly. That's fun. Look, it's, and it's rewarding. It's a lifelong study. And, uh, you know, whatever. And it'll, it'll help you remember thoroughly what's going on. And, and because uh, you have the message. You've been given the message. I'm still amazed at... Uh, at Peter, but you're going to have the full story. Second Timothy chapter two verse fifteen. Second Timothy chapter two verse fifteen. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Wait. Well, don't worry. You're going to be shown approved unto man, but you, that's not your objective. You prove yourself unto God, and God will place the people. And you're making an uh, approval of it. Don't become judgmental as you walk through, the, through your walk with life. There are five stages of spiritual growth. Meet people where they are. God met you, and he met me where I was. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 5, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself to prove unto God. You're not doing it to approve unto man. And God's going to use you. Study to show thyself to prove unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. If you want to be used. And by the way, I believe there's no other shortcut. Learn the Bible. You have to be a student. You're going to have to be able to delight in the word. Make it a discipline. J j just apply yourself. Here's the thing. You need to know the Bible. You need to know the Bible. <sighs> Repeating Acts, of, Acts chapter 4 verse 2. Being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. 
Acts chapter 4, verse 2. Well, let me read Acts chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, and I'll read that. I'll go back a little bit. In Acts chapter 4, start at the beginning. And as they spoke unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees, you know what the Sadducees were? Who, you know who they were? They were sad, you see. Sadducees, they were sad, you see. And the Sadducees, I'll give you a better definition later, came upon them. As they spoke unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. What? He wasn't resurrected from the dead. Boy, they got upset. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now even time. They put him in jail, Sadducees. The Sadducees put him in jail. Acts chapter 4, verse 2. Well, I read that, okay. The Sadducees were grieved, listening to Peter's preaching. Boy, they, you don't believe he, Peter's preaching. And they were greatly grieved. The Sadducees came upon them. And uh, in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, the primary opponents of Jesus and the disciples were the Pharisees. They, man, they were. They were the primary opponents. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Boy, they just hated those guys. The Pharisees were radical fundamentalists, that is, traditionalists. And they were very upset with Jesus. The Pharisees, very upset with him because they claimed that Jesus and disciples violated their established traditions and their ceremonial washings. And it's just like in certain churches where you got to be this, that, and the other. If you're not water baptized, you can't go to heaven. And they make all these rules, you know. You got to go, con all, I'm not going to get into all of that. They have the ceremonial things. And the Pharisees felt that Peter must be put to death. Because Peter violated their tradition. They hated Peter. And boy, he learned the word to know that they were not of God. Whereas the Sadducees, the Sadducees were very liberal. They could care less about that. And they could care less about what the Pharisees believed. The Sadducees, listen to this, didn't believe in angels. Angels? There's no such thing as angels. They were sad, you see. There's no such thing as angels. They did not believe in miracles. The Sadducees were sad, you see. They did not even believe in the resurrection from the dead. Uh-uh. Mm -mm. The Sadducees, oh, listen to this. They were materialistic, though. I don't want to offend anybody because they might not give to me. A tendency to consider material possessions. Boy, they, material, if they'd have been living today, they'd have been living in River Ranch. They'd have been living on some out in the country on 300 acres of land with a, a mansion. A mansion for them and a half the size mansion for their cows. Okay. The Sadducees were materialistic and physical pleasantries were the, one of the most important things for them. If they had a sofa, it was well-groomed, well-padded, and everything else, their bed. Everything was more important than the spiritual values. Sadducees didn't want anything spiritual. They just believed that you just should be a good person. And that's what a lot of churches today believe. Just be a good person. You go to church, it don't matter what you what church you go to. Just go to church. Just do that. Okay? And you go, just be a good person. You go to church. You don't have to listen to that junk. Just go to church and be a good person. Let people see. When you die, they're gonna sprinkle uh water on you and uh they're going to put oil and everything else, and you're going to be okay. Don't worry about it. That's 
the Sadducees, they're sad, you see. Just be nice to people. And help those that are hurting. If they're hurt, get a Band-Aid. Just you know, live by the golden rule. And there's only one more thing. They believe that what is yours is mine. What you got is mine. <laughs> and et cetera, and et cetera. That's what they believed. Sadducees. Now, they weren't vehemently opposed to Jesus. No, the Sadducees were not. Jesus, ha! Oh! They wouldn't talk that way. Because they wanted you to be friends with them and befriend you so you'd give them what they wanted. You see? Well, you, you, okay, well, it's your business if you want. Head with the book of Acts. The, Fer the Pharisees are no longer Jesus' primary opponents. Pharisees were no longer, G you know, Jesus' primary opponents. In fact, many of the Pharisees became believers, not the Sadducees. Not anything like the Pharisees. Many of the Pharisees became believers in Jesus Christ, but not the Sadducees. The Sadducees were getting upset because the Christians were preaching the resurrection from the dead. They, you do not believe in the resurrection of the dead. Boy, that got the Sadducees plumb upset, whereas the Pharisees believed. Oh, yeah. Now, what do the Christians preach today? Yeah, the Christians preach that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, there are then, and there are what? Miracles happening. Boy, we can have fun with that. And there are reports that angels are real. Oh, yeah? And boy, the Sadducees are, got really upset. If somebody said, I saw an angel, ha! You blinded thing, you. Boy, I mean, I can give you some more. I'm going to skip that on Sadducees because they're sad, you see. I don't spend too much time on the Sadducees. They got so angry. They put Christians in prison at every opportunity they could. They got angry. They laid hands on Christians for no reason. Put them in jail, certain areas. The Sadducees became the primary opponents of the life of Jesus because of the preachings of the Christians and Jesus had risen from the dead. They couldn't stand the preachings about him raising, being raised from the dead. And they, I'll tell you what, if you said you were saved around a Sadducee, you were in trouble. They got angry. They put him in prison, Acts chapter 4, verse 3. Let me read Acts chapter 4, verse 2. In Acts chapter 4, verse 2 to 4, I'll give you a statistic. In Acts chapter 4, verse 2 to 4. In Acts chapter 4, verse 2 to 4. Being grieved, this is the Sadducees, that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. What? They preaching that junk. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold. The word hold there means prison. In prison. Yeah, custody. On to the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men was about 5,000. Boy, let me tell you, man, they heard that Jesus raised them and everything. 5,000 got saved. What? They heard the word. They heard the preachings of Peter. Boy, man, Peter preached. They heard that, and they believed. He was anointed because the word of God is what? Powerful. Learn the word. You know why? Why the word? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick. For the word of God is quick. Maybe some of y'all are not quickened by the Holy Spirit to give you a word as you read another chapter, another verse, because you haven't read the word. 
Oh, you, you went. I read my chapter for today. That's not the way to read the word. The word's not going to come alive to you that way. Well, the pastor said we ought to read this chapter today before we come back next week. Well, I'm going to read it. Oh, now, it's 6 o'clock time for the news. I mean, you're not going to learn it anyway, okay? The word of God is quick. You know what that word quick means in closing? Alive. It's not just words. It's the word. The, okay, this was shocking maybe. The words in the Bible are alive. You see? You have any life in your life? That means you... Yeah, oh, I'm, I'm happy, man. When you get the word inside, the word is alive. You be amazed at what that alive word will come forth when you're talking to your neighbors, your friends, and everything. At the right time, he'll give you something to say. It's alive. He'll quicken you. It's powerful. It's The word is Sharper than any two-edged sword. Sharper than any, not single-edged, because it goes and then back again. It does the job. It cuts that sin out. It cuts those bad thoughts out. Piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit. It can separate the soul from the spirit. Mind, will, and emotion. And your spirit man. If this don't line up, your spirit man goes, no! <laughs> <laughs> and of the joints and marrow. And is a discerner. Look at this. And the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart. What you really want is me, myself, and I. I might be here today, but when I leave this place, it's like I've never been. My life ain't going to change a bit. God is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Get there when you die. And he prayerfully, he won't say, you have a form of godliness denying the power thereof. I told you to go out, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, and raise the dead. All of those that you met around you sick, you didn't heal. All of those that had leprosy, but something like leprosy, you didn't heal. And you, how many did you raise from the dead? You didn't raise any. Okay? And he's going to say, what else did you not do? Well, your heart, the enemy came immediately and stole the word. And you said, yes, yes, take it away. Now I don't have to do that. <laughs> I'm so good. You're going to follow when you become a Christian, not because you have to. You're going to, can't wait to get with it. You understand? Wait, you understand? Wait, I'm telling you. It's going to be, and you don't have to show it to everybody. No, it's going to be something inside that as you walk, okay, as Jesus walked, you walked gently and you did the work. You don't have to make, put jingle bells on you and lights on your head and show them that you're Christian. You know, <laughs> I'm a Christian, you know. Well, I wear those T-shirts because <laughs> about, about, are you saved? <laughs> you know, I better do that. Do you know Jesus? I'm going to have to wear that shirt next Sunday, okay? The one that I wore this week. I should have worn it today. Share the word. Share the word with the kids you're raising up, with your grandkids and all that. Share the word. Share share with your grandkids. Share, share the word with your neighbor. Share, share the word with your mother-in-law and your father-in-law. And your grandpa, share the scripture. It's powerful. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop.
Well, I'll tell you. I'll just say one more thing. I'm going to talk about the Chinese man named Deng Lo. D-I-N-G-L-O. A missionary was doing that back in the 1930s in inland uh, Siena. And he was just sharing the word everywhere he'd go. Everywhere he'd go, he would just talk scriptures. And he would pass out copies of the Gospel of Matthew. There was a, cre a Chinese man whose name was Deng Lo. He was preaching. Grabbed one of the copies of the handout of the Gospel of Matthew. And he flipped through it skeptically. Walked back to his home. And wasn't liking what he was reading in that book of Matthew. In, in, in that thing. It was a handout on the Gospel of Matthew. It, was, it wasn't a book, it was a, a handout. And he, he just didn't like it. He was convicted. It was like one chapter, Matthew or something. So he took that little gospel of Matthew and threw it into the fireplace in his front room. He was sitting there reading it. And then he got he read that, that little handout in Matthew. Man, ah, ah, he threw that in his fireplace. He got rid of the word. He got rid of that stuff. The next day, Deng Lo was cleaning, cleaning out his fireplace, forgotten about that thing. And the whole Gospel of Matthew was burned in the fire, excepting one little piece. And that little piece which was left was Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. And it said in red, Matthew 28, verse 20. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. And by the way, that's the last verse in Matthew chapter 28. The end result, Deng Lo read it, read the fragment, got saved and became a believer. <laughs> Father God, I just thank you for this day, and I thank you that you've given us a life instead of death. You've given us eternal life rather than ah, what was planned for my life by the enemy, eternal death. Going back three and four generations, Lord, I mean, I stand here today. We all stand here today. We can look back three and four generations and see how many of our relatives, those who do genealogy charts and everything else, like my daughter, she does that from, from Dallas, from where, where she, McKinney. She's a genealogist, and boy, she's got stuff and stuff. How many of those were saved? I think I'm going to tell them that this afternoon. They can find out. <laughs> and so, uh, I don't know. What I'm saying is we can change the direction of the next generation. And that next generation on that generational chart, on those generational charts, can show differently than they were. Are we going to get there? Get into heaven, and God's going to show you, here's your generation going back hundreds of years. And here you are. And here are the generations now that have been children born, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, three once removed and all of that, whatever that means. And how many of those are saved? So we need to pray. Father God, I thank you that you've given us a thirst and a hunger for the word. That, Lord, we're not just going to walk out of here, but f we're going to carry something with us in our souls. We would like, or they're going to reach a point, somebody in here, or all of will, reach a point where they're going to say, Lord, I want to be used. You're going to have to know the word. Because when you get to know the word, it's going to become alive in you. And when you begin to know the word, not only will it become alive, but you are going to want. The alive word is going to want you to do something with it, to share it. You're going to want to share the word with those that the Lord shows you, opens the door for. Lord, bless them. 
bless their comings and bless their going on this Memorial Day weekend. I thank you that we can breathe free air and exhale free air because of what the servicemen did in fighting for us and dying for us. Thousands and thousands and thousands died. Multiple thousands. Perhaps hundreds of thousands. Here we are. Speaking as of the oracles of God. That you spoke to us. They were in your army. And may we, in your army, die also to self and become alive with the word of God in the name of Jesus. And the Bible says, too much is given, much is required. Let the past be taken away as past. Start living the future now. In Jesus' name, everybody said what? And I want to thank you men for sharing what y'all shared today in the military. You understand? Thank y'all. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate it. And we bless Ben's son. What's his first name? Egan. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.